Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of the Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. Beeswax candles have been used in religious ceremonies and for daily worship by numerous faiths. Beeswax is also used for a myriad of things, including cosmetics, and many years ago was actually used to pay the rent. On today's show, Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald will be my guest to talk about beeswax candles and their many uses. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom, and thank you for joining me. Good afternoon, June, from a snowy Colorado. Tom, I know many of our listeners have been listening to the Neo Nicotinoid View, which you co-host with me. But for people that are just learning about you, could you share with our listeners how long you've been a beekeeper? Boy, it's hard to believe, but this is the 40th year, June. And how long have you been making candles? I think I started making candles the second or third year I was a beekeeper. I was a what I refer to as a community beekeeper, but... I approached 200 colonies of bees, and that the harvest, honey harvest, results in a fairly considerable amount of beeswax for an operation that size. And uh, as it began to to build up, I, I was doing a lot of reading and everything, and knew a little bit about beeswax candles. And I had the the wax, and I had the time in the winter, so I decided that I was. I would just experiment a little bit. And originally, it was sort of an excuse for a grown man to stay up all night and howl at the moon. I've always been a, a big fan of the full moon. And I would start warming everything up about 2 in the afternoon by dusk. Uh, the dipping was ready to proceed. I would dip candles through the night. And when I got tired or need to stretch my muscles or something, I'd step outside and enjoy the full moon and then come back in and dip the candles. And I uh, didn't, as I said, I didn't know a whole lot about beeswax candles, but that I knew beeswax candles were good. And it wasn't long before my customers began to educate me. They found out that I had done some candles and they began to request a few for them, a few for their friends. And before I knew it, uh, this excuse to howl at the full moon had become my my winter occupation. Thanks, Tom. Now, before we get into your hobby of howling, um, can you talk about the actual process itself? First and foremost, do all beekeepers make candles? And how much wax is required to make one candlestick, your average candlestick? Well, most beekeepers don't do candles, or they might do a few for themselves and a few friends. And of those, most of them would do poured candles, where beeswax is poured into a mold. Um, but as far as actual candle making, where the candles go into the hands of many other people, very few candle makers left because it's very time consuming. The best candles are the dipped candles. And this is historically the way candles had been made in volume for centuries, for millennia. I do hand dipped beeswax candles and there's a number of advantages to a hand dipped candle. It's think of it sort of as a piece of laminated wood or plywood, that lamination gives it strength. And the successive layers that are put down on a hand-dipped candle give that candle additional strength. 
So it's a really a superior candle. But again, the investment is time, and in this day and age, there aren't too many people who want to take the kind of time that is necessary to do it right. There are some definite advantages to beeswax candles in situations like churches, where there are religious connotations to the purity of beeswax. But beeswax, because of that lamination and because of its characteristics, beeswax will maintain its form at a higher range of temperatures, whereas paraffin candles can begin to wilt. So, obviously, I'm in love with beeswax candles. I may not be completely unbiased, but that's part of the story behind beeswax candles. Tom, could you explain to our listeners exactly how much beeswax is required to make one candle, and how many frames are you talking about? Exactly what's involved with as far as the bees are concerned? I've done this for many, many years, and, and I'm kind of a record keeper of sorts, so I've kept track of how much beeswax is involved and how much beeswax has been produced based upon the honey production. The beeswax that we use for candles is what's called cappings wax. These are the new cappings on each of those little honeycomb cells that the bees apply when the honey has been changed to the proper moisture content, the enzymes have been added, the sugars have been inverted. Each of those cells is capped, and that beeswax is new each year. That gets removed with a hot knife of different kinds, so that the cells are reopened and that frame of honey can be put in a machine called an extractor which rotates the honey comes out of the comb runs down the side of the extractor comes out a valve at the bottom the honeycomb can be used year after year the cappings are a byproduct and i've found that on average over the years a hundred pounds of honey will yield about a pound to a pound and a half of cappings wax. So we get a pound to a pound and a half of cappings wax for every 100 pounds of honey. The average production for a colony of bees, uh, it certainly plummeted in the last few years, but if we just forget that for a moment, might be 75 pounds of honey. In some cases, much more than that, where conditions are, are right. But... Uh, Average might be 75 pounds across the country. So it's a byproduct, relatively small in quantity compared to the honey production. And so what does a candle require? Well, obviously, it depends on the size of the candle, the diameter, and the length. What I do are 11 inch, 11 and a half inch tapers. And the standard diameter for a taper like that would be seven-eighths of an inch. If you were to measure most of the candle holders, you would find that they are fitted for a seven-eighth inch candle. So that's what I produce. A seven-eighth inch diameter, 11 and a half inch taper, requires about a fifth of a pound of beeswax. So we can get five of those kinds of candles out of a pound of beeswax. Uh, the beeswax may represent 100 pounds of honey production. Y you see the relationship. What does that mean for hobbyist beekeepers? How many hives do they have to keep before they would be able to harvest enough wax to produce their own candles? Well, let's just take the uh, a typical hobbyist beekeeper and assume that they're successful and are able to produce perhaps 100 pounds of honey. That might yield for them a pound to a pound and a half of wax. Now, obviously, they can't make many candles with that amount of beeswax. But they can use it in other ways that will stretch it a little further. Uh, one of the ways is in a variety of salves and lotions and things like that. Or they can accumulate it over time and, and build up a, a significant amount so that they can actually make some candles. But they don't have the... Uh, the volumes of beeswax that a larger beekeeper would have. How difficult is it to purify the wax? <laughs> Depends on whether you spill it or not. 
Um, I'm being funny, of course, but or at least I hope I am. Molten beeswax, it will melt at about 143 degrees. If you are to spill it or drop it on something, it pretty much welds itself to whatever it has cooled on. In cases where there may be some drips, I use either surfaces like formica, which can be scraped easily, or even better is uh, plastic. And what happens is the beeswax cools, and you just flex that sheet of plastic a little bit, and off pops the beeswax, and it can go back into the pot, and nothing is lost. The interesting thing I find about beeswax, and obviously you have a lot of time to think when you're doing candles. This is a several-hour process. I'm in the honey house. It's in the winter. It's quiet. I have no phone ringing. On the best days, I may be looking out the windows and watching the snow sift down through the air. It's a wonderful way to spend some time. Purification is basically a flotation and filtering process. Beeswax is lighter than water. So beeswax is melted over a, a short layer of water. And almost anything that's in the beeswax will either float or sink. The floaters can be skimmed off with a little piece of window screen. And the, the pure wax, which is above the sinkers, and what we call in the bee world slum gum, and these are organic particles, maybe a dead bee here and there. It could be any of a number of things, but that's the slum gum. And when that beeswax cools, that slum gum is going to be the layer on the bottom. So for the small hobbyist, the way to remove the pure beeswax is to, be, is to carefully dip it from the surface without disturbing the slum gum down below. For, in my case, where I'm ha handling larger volumes, I have a large crock pot with a spigot. And after all the wax has been melted in that, that five-gallon crock pot is full of melted beeswax, I introduce hot water, which raises the level of the beeswax. It comes out an overflow and into a fine filter and then into cake pans, basically, which are set aside to cool. It'll cool in just a few hours and can be removed from the cake pans, and it's like uh, bricks of gold. It's just a wonderful substance to work with. Now, isn't it true that beeswax actually floats? That's what I said. It, it is lighter than water, so it will float on the surface of the water. And if you have it in a container that has water on the bottom and beeswax, melted beeswax all the rest of the way up, and then you introduce hot water, the level will be raised and the beeswax will come out the spigot, in my case. It's a piece of equipment that I had specially made for this. What I was getting at, though, when I was talking about being in the honey house and having a lot of time to think is I've kind of thought of beeswax candles as a something that's just embedded in our genetic memory. Now, I don't know if we have a genetic memory or not, but if we do, the, beeswax, the light of a beeswax candle is certainly deeply embedded there. And even before candles were made, it might have been nothing more than a clamshell or a hollowed-out rock filled with beeswax with a piece of moss as a wick. But we have harvested honey from the dimmest beginnings of our species, and certainly we took advantage of the beeswax, and when, once we had discovered fire, I'm sure we discovered beeswax. We discovered that it would burn, and we discovered that it chased away the terrors of the night. But the way I think of it is bees produce honey by inverting the sugars, and it's a process called elaboration the change from raw, raw nectar into finished honey. A second step in that elaboration is the production of beeswax. And the young bees, within the first couple of weeks of their life, have glands 
between their abdominal segments, and they produce little flakes of pure beeswax. They convert honey, they consume honey, and they convert that metabolically to beeswax. And they extrude that, and then with their feet, they mold that into the honeycomb. Um, but the origin of that beeswax is sunlight. Sunlight that is captured by a plant community, converted to a carbohydrate, a sugar, to attract a pollinating insect so that it could repeat itself. It could be pollinated, but it captures the sunlight, converts the sunlight to a sweet liquid. The bees collect that. They convert it to honey. And then they convert it to beeswax, and I come along, and I turn that beeswax into a candle. And when that candle burns, that's releasing that light energy that was captured on some lovely summer afternoon. I mean, how more beautiful can it get than that? Now, isn't it true that beeswax is also very stable? Uh, someone once told me that... There was a study in which they took a sample from beeswax that was very, very old. It was over a thousand years old, and it was nearly identical with new beeswax. And basically, it's because of the very process. And furthermore, beeswax does not oxidize and is not affected by mildew. I thought that was fascinating. Well, one of the uh, interesting factoids that we all learn as new beekeepers is that uh, beeswax was a major uh, commodity in the trade around the Mediterranean. The Egyptians were among the first of the successful beekeepers, and then the Greeks and the Romans, but the the Egyptians were the first, and there was a fairly substantial trade involving beeswax because it had many practical applications. And the thing we all learn as new beekeepers is that beeswax was often in the hold of ships that went down in the Mediterranean. Subsequently discovered, they found that the beeswax was virtually unchanged. So, as you say, it's very stable. It has lots of uses. It's a great substance. You know, we've, you, we've utilized beeswax in one way or another for thousands of years. And well, you mentioned you mentioned the ancient Egyptians, and from what I understand, they used to use beeswax when they were embalming and going through the mummification process for their pharaohs, as well as uh, for applications, even for cosmetic reasons, with their with their wigs and just with their hair. So I think that's quite fascinating that you, that you bring up the ancient Egyptians because it was a very, very valuable product to them. Yeah, and one of the other factoids that we learn is that they've found honey in the, in the pyramids that after 2,000 years is still edible. And, uh, you know, maybe it is. I guess it depends on your definition of edible. But I've had an opportunity to test that just recently Fifteen years ago, I had a location where the new owners decided that they were going to grow echinacea for the herbal market. The herbal market was just beginning to blossom then. So I had an opportunity to harvest an echinacea honey. And I set several cases of it aside, thinking that I would just use it over the terms of the future and... and uh, what happened was the honey house gets fairly warm in the summer, and the different segments of the honey separated. It would be uh, more granulated toward the bottom, then a, maybe a one-inch layer of liquid honey, and then on the top, what I presume to be the fine wax particles and pollen grains that had risen through the honey over time. Not very attractive, however, and it just sat there, and I didn't do anything with it. But several months ago, I decided that I was going to give it a try. And what I found was that while it might not look very attractive, it was perfectly edible. It still had fine flavor. There were no off flavors. In fact, it didn't seem like any flavor had been lost. So maybe 
You could eat 2,000-year-old honey from the pyramids. I don't know. Tom, let's talk about burning. How long does a beeswax candle burn as opposed to the synthetics, the paraffin candles and other types of candles? Well, one of the one of the characteristics that beeswax is known for is that it's slow burning. And that 7 8 inch by 11 and a half inch taper I was talking about earlier would take about 9 hours to burn from top to bottom to completely consume itself. So um, it's very long lasting. And in in the ancient times, it was sometimes used as a timepiece, a very large candle burned in a draft free environment could burn at such a steady rate that you could use it to mark time. Wow, that's really fascinating. Now, in addition to burning, one of the other tremendous benefits, especially for someone such as myself who has so many allergies, is the scent. Tom, can you share with our listeners why beeswax candles are actually more beneficial to the environment than the synthetics? Well, I think I understand what you're getting at, June. I... Uh, I've had a number of customers who have either been chemically sensitive or who have children who are chemically sensitive. And they tell me that they can only burn beeswax candles. That if they burn any other candles, they or their children will react to it. And I got to wondering about that. And I think there is some, some basic reason for that difference. The the standard candles today, what's most widely used in candles, is uh, paraffin. Paraffin is a petroleum product. And the, the products that are produced when that candle is burned are <laughs> uh, products from combustion of that petroleum. And it's like having your lawnmower idling in your living room. You're getting the same sorts of byproducts from that paraffin candle that you would get from a four-cycle engine or a two-cycle engine. Obviously, I'm overstating that, but the chemically sensitive people are the ones who are warning us of the difference. They don't react to a beeswax candle, which is an organic product. doesn't necessarily mean that it's completely harmless, but it certainly appears to be. Or... Uh, paraffin, which is a petroleum product. And in many cases, it's made even worse because these ca candles are scented, and the scent is added to that combustion product. So what I've heard from many, many people, though, beyond any chemical sensitivity is that they, and this is without any prompting from me, that there's something about the light of a, be a beeswax candle that they find very soothing. And I think that goes back to what I said earlier. I think that... You cut out. You cut out. Say it all over again that you find it very soothing. I've, I've had a number of customers who've told me without any prompting from me that they find the light of a beeswax candle very soothing and it's kind of a mystery to them. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier. I think that that light may very well be deeply embedded in our genetic memory. Thank you, Tom. And lastly, as a cosmetic application, could you share with our listeners a little bit about your own experience using beeswax in creams and lotions and whatnot? Because they, it's very true that beekeepers do have very soft hands. Early in my beekeeping career, a, uh, a farm wife called one day and said, Tom, I came across a recipe for beeswax salve in an old beekeeping magazine, and, and I've always had trouble with my hands drying out in the winter. We have very arid climate here in Colorado. She said, my hands would dry and crack, and over the years I've tried almost everything. And I thought, well, I'll give this beeswax salve a try. They had two or three colonies of their own, so they had some beeswax. She said, I did, and 
and it worked beautifully. I it completely cleared up the problems with my hands in the winter. And she said, I thought you might be interested in making it and selling it. So I made up a batch. I, at that time, I still had friends who were having children, and they, they could supply me with baby food jars, and I would make up a batch, and I'd give it out to people I knew who worked with their hands, farmers and ranchers and construction workers. One of my favorite uh, test subjects were cement workers, because cement is really hard on your skin. Um, at the time, I was guiding, and I took some and passed it out amongst some of the guides. And the next year, I uh, was sitting on the side of a mountain with one of those fellows, and I said, Chris, what did you think of that beeswax hand cream? He said, well, you know, Tom, I don't use much of that stuff, but my horse got a bad wire cut over the winter, and I it would not heal. And then I thought of that beeswax stuff, and I put that on that wire cut on his chest, and I'll be darned if it didn't heal it right up. So I've always said it's good for man or beast. Uh, somewhere along the line, I had a friend who was in massage school, and she said that she suggested that rather than use mineral oil, which was the original recipe, I use almond oil. So many years ago, I switched over to almond oil, and I make a, a beeswax hand cream that I call bee balm that has two basic ingredients, almond oil and beeswax. And it's good for almost anything. It has no weird chemicals in it. It's, it's just very useful stuff. I'd like to share something with everyone. Over the summer, I actually gave myself second-degree burns when I was making French fries for my sister. And I had splotches of oil all over my arm, my right arm. And I had iced it up. And after speaking to Tom, he said, you know, use some of that bee balm that I gave you. And I did. And within maybe three days, I was surprised that instead of my skin forming welts on my arm, it actually begun to heal. And now, this is uh, several months later, there's no sign of any of the burns. There's no scarring, no nothing. So I am so grateful to beekeepers that take the time to harvest the wax and produce products like that that really are able to heal us. So, Tom, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for all of your time, your knowledge, and all of your efforts to keep bees. It's just tremendous, and more people, I hope, learn about what you do as well as learn how to love bees as much as we do. It's been a very interesting journey, June. I was talking with a commercial beekeeper who's uh, third generation. His family started in bees in 1907, and we were we were kind of laughing about the fact that we continue – in the face of huge problems, his losses are running 60%, and this is a very large operation. And we both just had to admit that it's a love affair, that we can't imagine a life without bees. Nor should we ever want to. Tom, isn't it true that you actually donate some of your candles? Well, after Barbara died... Uh, I got to thinking that a way that I could remember her would be to make beeswax candles for the church that she grew up in back in southern Wisconsin. And uh, each, each year I'd make a special batch of candles that go on the altar at the Episcopal Church in Delavan, Wisconsin at Christmas and Easter. And, uh, you know, they say a little bit about what the origin of the candles are and mention Barbara by name. And Barbara's twin sister, Mary, is still attending the church. And uh, there are many local people who still remember Barbara. So it's just a, a way that I can contribute some something I know in remembrance of Barbara. I think that's very sweet and also extremely romantic. I mean, to have candles made that will be burned in a church in memory of someone that you love is just such a beautiful gesture. 
Tom, I just want to say thank you for being on the show today. It's really been a pleasure just taking a moment to learn about some of the things in your life and why you became a beekeeper. Well, thank you, June, and thank you for giving me the opportunity not only to talk about what I do, but to talk about very important issues that face us all. So it's uh, it's been very interesting. I never anticipated that I'd be doing this sort of thing, but here I am. And Tom, I, I truly am grateful, especially for the candles that you've given me over the years. And folks, let me tell you, when you burn a beeswax candle, the light is so beautiful. And just the scent that it leaves in the room, even though they don't necessarily have a scent, it actually is something, especially with all the allergies that I have, that is pleasing. And once again, it's just so incredibly beautiful. Please check out the companion article, which will be available on theorganicview.com, which will also have a number of different facts that we didn't talk about, but just things that are amusing, especially if you want to share them with your kids or with people that you love. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>